okay so moving on to the next property this is a very interesting one the cardiac muscle requires calcium from ecf from the extracellular fluid okay so the cardiac muscle to contract it requires calcium just like skeletal muscle right skeletal muscle requires calcium for its contraction similarly cardiac muscle requires its uh, calcium for its contraction but there is a slight difference between the skeletal and the cardiac muscle contractions so before i explain this entire thing to you there is a word that you should know and that word is excitation contraction coupling that word is excitation contraction coupling now what does excitation contraction coupling mean excitation means that the tissue is excited that the cardiac muscle is excited that there is an action potential here i'll show you there's an action potential that's coming right that's the action potential of cardiac muscle so action potential is coming the cardiac muscle is getting excited and the action potential spreads and leads to the mechanical event of contraction so this entire process in which excitation or action potential of the cardiac muscle leads to its contraction is known as excitation contraction coupling now this here you, that you can see this is the longitudinal section of the cardiac muscle so what you can see here is this is the microscopic structure we all know the structure of skeletal muscles this is a z line and these are the thick filaments and then these are the thin filaments right actin on the thin filaments and thick filaments have myosin and this is the z line and the area between two z line is known as the sarcomere so as you can see here this and this these are the z lines and these are the filaments the thick and thin filaments so this is the microscopic representation so why i have drawn this here is because i want to show you something really important to explain the excitation contraction coupling this green things that you can see going inside this outside this black is the plasma membrane or the sarcolemma or the sarcolemma the plasma membrane of a muscle fiber is known as sarcolemma right sarco means muscle so this is the sarcolemma sarcolemma extends inwards into the cardiac muscle fibers and these extensions are known as transverse tubules or t tubules transverse tubules or t tubules they are known as right so this is the transverse tubules now here you can see these green structures right these green structures and this blue structure this thing is the endoplasmic reticulum it is the endoplasmic reticulum endoplasmic reticulum present in the muscle is known as sarcoplasmic reticulum just like the plasma membrane is sarcolemma the endoplasmic reticulum is sarcoplasmic reticulum so the point where endoplasmic reticulum meets the t tubule or the transverse tubule it shows a dilation right so these dilations are known as terminal cisterns now if you can see here i have labeled them as longitudinal channels now what do you mean by longitudinal longitudinal because these are longitudinal to the these are along the axis of the cardiac muscle fiber right these are transverse or perpendicular the, to the axis to the long axis of the cardiac muscle fiber therefore these are known as transverse tubules and these are known as longitudinal tubules or longitudinal channels these are nothing plus but sarcoplasmic reticulum the terminal parts near the t tubule show dilations these are known as terminal cisterns these are known as terminal cisterns and this entire thing the two terminal cisterns and the t tubule they together are known as the triad it is called as a triad three things tri means three so three things are two terminal cisterns and one transverse tubule so this is a triad now another thing to notice here is that the similar structure is present even in the skeletal muscles excitation contraction coupling occurs also in the skeletal muscles but the difference here is that this t tubule the transverse tubule in the cardiac muscle it innervates or it passes along or in the line of the z line you see this is a z line so this is the line so z line and the transverse tubules they lie in the same plane right even here see this is a z line this is the transverse tubule so they lie in the same plane so we can say that per sarcomere this is a sarcomere you have only one t tubule this t tubule will belong to this sarcomere right another t tubule here will belong to this sarcomere so per sarcomere there is one transverse tubule whereas in skeletal muscle per 
T upper sarcomere there are two T tubules right there are two T tubules in skeletal muscles so that we'll talk about when we come to the skeletal muscle part here we're talking about the cardiac muscle so there is one transverse tubule per sarcomere right so this is the structure here this is what you can see coming to the transverse section so coming here this you can see this is the invagination of the sarcolemma this is the sarcolemma this is the invagination this is obviously the transverse tubule t tubule this is the terminal dilatations so i have just magnified a triad here this is the transverse tubule here and these are the terminal cisterns as you can see the blue cisterns they are terminal cisterns right so let me explain to you the uh, use of ecf calcium or the excitation contraction coupling so what happens normally in both skeletal as well as cardiac muscles first we'll see that then we'll see how the cardiac muscles are specific or how they differ from the skeletal muscles okay so what happens this is the action potential the action potential comes as you know the property of action potential is that it is conducted the property of cardiac muscle is that one of the properties is conductivity it can conduct the action potential right so action potential comes here it moves inside the T tubule, the function of the T tubule or transverse tubule is to conduct the action potentials to the interior of the muscle, right? So that the action potential spreads inside. So this transverse tubule will carry the action potential down. The action potential will come here and will open up this channel. It will open up this channel. This is a calcium channel. What channel is this? This is a calcium channel. Just keep in mind this point regarding to cardiac muscle. This does not occur in skeletal muscle. So first we'll talk about what happens on the inside then I'll come back to this. What happens is the action potential moves in and this is a terminal cistern having a specific receptor. This receptor is known as the rhinodyne receptor. Rhinodyne. Now rhinodyne is a chemical substance and because this receptor is sensitive to this rhinodyne it is known as the rhinodyne receptor. Okay. So action potential comes here and it opens up the rhinodyne receptor it opens up so the rhinodyne receptor opens up there is a channel that's formed within the cisterns there is presence there is concentration of calcium large amounts of calcium are present so calcium will start moving out calcium will start moving out calcium will start moving out calcium will come here calcium will act on troponin c do you remember in skeletal muscle there is actin myosin there is tropomyosin and there is troponin troponin is i t and c so if calcium binds to troponin c it leads to the sliding filament theory or muscle contraction right so for muscles to contract you need calcium calcium comes from the terminal cisterns of the sarcoplasmic reticulum how do the terminal cisterns open because of action potential what are the channels or the receptors the rhinodyne receptors action potential comes the rhinodyne receptors open calcium leaks out binds with troponin c and causes muscle contraction this is same in skeletal and cardiac muscle now where the cardiac muscle differs let's come back here this is a specific calcium channel that is present in the sarcolemma as you can see this entire thing is a sarcolemma this is a t tubule but this is sarcolemma right t tubule is an extension of uh, sarcolemma so within the sarcolemma there is this calcium channel so action potential opens up this calcium channel as well only in the cardiac muscle so if this calcium channel is open what do you think will come in what is present here this space is filled with what extracellular fluid right within the cell there is intracellular fluid outside the cell there is extracellular fluid so the extracellular fluid here will start moving in what does this extracellular fluid have high amounts of calcium why because this extracellular fluid is rich in negatively charged mucopolysaccharides it is rich in negatively charged mucopolysaccharides so the negatively charged mucopolysaccharides will attract and bind with calcium so that when these channels open this calcium will move in it will come inside again bind with troponin c and cause muscle contraction so this is a very specific or peculiar character of only cardiac muscle that it requires extracellular fluid calcium this is not required in skeletal muscle remember ecf calcium is not required in skeletal muscle contraction it is required only and only in cardiac muscle contraction okay this is the reason that whenever there is decrease or deficiency of calcium in the ecf 
the cardiac muscle contraction weakens. Whereas in skeletal muscle, the ECF value of calcium does not play a significant role in the strength of contraction. Okay. So this is a very important point. So what happens is that the calcium moves in, binds to troponin C and causes muscle contraction. Now the muscle has contracted or rather the heart has contracted. That is the heart is in systole. Okay. Once the heart is in systole, it needs to relax. For the heart to relax, to come in diastole, this calcium has to be pumped out. So this is done in two ways. The, this is done in two ways in the fact that wherever the calcium has entered from, we send it out via the same routes. For example, if the calcium has come out from the terminal cisterns, we send it back into the terminal cisterns by the use of a calcium pump, which requires ATP. So few amounts of calcium are pumped back into the terminal cisterns. The calcium which has come from ECF is pumped back into the ECF by another pump, which is known as the sodium calcium pump. It is known as the sodium calcium pump. So what happens is this is the sodium calcium pump. So calcium that comes from the terminal cisterns is pumped back. Calcium that comes from the ECF is also pumped back. Here it is only calcium channel and here it is sodium calcium channels. Okay. Sodium moves in and calcium moves out. Now if you know that calcium is plus 2 and sodium is plus 1. So to maintain the electrical neutrality for each calcium that moves out two sodium ions are pumped in. Simple. For each calcium because calcium is plus 2 each calcium ion that moves out two sodium ions move in. Okay. So this will lead to a deficiency of sodium inside the muscle inside the sarcoplasm here there is icf or sarcoplasm so if calcium reduces there is no calcium that binds to troponin c troponin c is free the tropomyosin will again cover the active sites and the contraction will stop and the muscle will relax so heart will reach its diastole so you see there is systole increased calcium there is diastole because of decreased calcium so this is how, how the heart beats and this is all about the excitation contraction coupling in the heart and this is all about this specific property that cardiac muscle requires calcium from ecf and skeletal muscle does not require calcium from ecf okay so that's one property there coming to the next property the frank starling law cardiac muscles or rather uh, skeletal muscles as well they follow the frank starling law before I tell you what Frank Starling law is, I need you to know two important terms. The terms are preload and afterload. Preload, as the term suggests, acts pre, that is before the muscle starts contraction. Load means basically resistance against which a muscle has to work. Okay, that's load. Preload means the resistance acts on the muscle before it has started to contract. In heart, it is the end diastolic volume. What is end diastolic volume? Now, if this is the heart, right? These are the atria, this is the ventricle. The ventricles get filled with blood coming from the atria. So when the ventricles are contracting, when they're in diastole, they get filled with blood. As soon as the ventricles are filled, they begin to contract. Just before they begin to contract, the volume of blood present in the ventricles is known as end diastolic volume. The volume of blood present at the end of diastole is end diastolic volume. So because the blood is present there, it will exert a certain amount of stretch in the ventricular wall, right? So that is known as the preload because ventricles have not started to contract, but the blood is causing a stretch. It is acting as a resistance. So that is the preload. Okay. What is afterload? Afterload means the resistance against which the muscle has to work after it has started to contract. In the case of heart, the left ventricle pumps blood into the aorta, right? So the pressure in the aorta is the resistance against which the left ventricle has to pump the blood. So the pressure in the aorta will act as afterload. So preload and afterload are clear. Now let me tell you what Frank Starling's law says. Frank Starling's law says that within physiological limits, the force of contraction is directly proportional to the initial length of the muscle fiber. This means that the force of contraction depends upon the initial length initial stretch on the muscle fiber because of end diastolic volume as in the case of heart if we consider this relation in the form of a graph we'll see that as the length of the muscle fiber increases as the stretch on the muscle increases the force of contraction will also increase 
that is it is positively inotropic okay more the stretch or more the initial length more is the force of contraction but within physiological limits okay there's a limit so therefore we get a slightly curved shape here length of muscle increases force of contraction will also increase but till a certain limit after which even if you increase the length of initial length of the muscle fiber the force of contraction cannot increase because it has reached its physiological limit so this is a normal curve the black one the red one you can see here is that if you increase if we draw a line like this and we fix or we make the length constant so if you see here the force of contraction is this much but for the red line the force of contraction is this it is higher so force of contraction has increased this means this is this is a normal graph like i said the black one is a it is a normal one so above normal one it means there is some positively inotropic factor that has acted on the heart and it has caused an increase in the force of contraction right similarly the blue line there is decrease in the force of contraction of the same length of muscle fiber so the factors acting are negatively inotropic inotropy again is the force of contraction right so this is the normal one the red one is the positively inotropic and the blue one is the negatively inotropic one now coming to the last property of cardiac muscle if we consider now there's just one remaining uh, there are two terms basically that people often confuse actually they're not really confusing but people tend to confuse those terms and they're very simple these terms are fatigue and tetanus okay so fatigue means there is reduced ability of the muscle to contract and tetanus means sustained state of contraction so the last property here that we're talking about the 10th property here is cardiac muscle cannot be fatigued cardiac muscle cannot be fatigued imagine if your heart is fatigued if your heart is tired will you be able to live will you be able to survive normally obviously not okay so the cardiac muscle cannot be fatigued fatigue means the muscle gets tired it stops working temporarily after a period of rest you regain the power of contraction so cardiac muscle does not get fatigued and why there are a few reasons the first reason is long refractory period like we talked about in the one of the properties the cardiac muscle has a long refractory period because of the long refractory period the cardiac muscle gets enough time to complete is complete its systole and diastole so that another systole can start after it has rested after the diastole is complete another systole begins after the muscle relaxes another contraction begins so it gets time to rest before another contraction sets in so it cannot be fatigued right the second point is that it has large amount of blood supply large blood supply the cardiac muscle is uh, the cardiac muscle has large amount of blood supply and it has a huge capillary density compared to other muscle like skeletal muscles the capillary density here is much more the third point is that cardiac muscles show aerobic respiration they show aerobic respiration therefore there is no accumulation of lactic acid there is no anaerobic respiration so no lactic acid develops since no lactic acid develops there is no fatigue lactic acid is an important cause of fatigue and the fourth reason that there is no fatigue is that the cardiac muscle is rich in mitochondria it has large amounts of mitochondria in fact one third the weight of a cardiac muscle fiber is due to mitochondria right so these are the properties of cardiac muscle with this we end with the first lecture of cardiovascular unit i hope it made sense i hope it will be easy for you to understand once you get back to the books and i'll see you in the next one